I, in 2016, I was um, a medical school student. Yeah. So I was doing a Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery at the University of Nairobi. I had taken a gap year, so that's a one year off, yeah. uh, to do something called Bachelor in Medical Physiology, which is a research course. It's a scientific research course. So they teach you how to think about things fundamentally from, um, from the ground. In Kenya, folks are venturing into unique businesses sparked by the crypto wave. Today, we're diving into the story of Felix Masharia, the brain behind Kotani Pay. But hey, before we dive in, hit that subscribe button to ensure you never miss out on such intriguing tales. So Kotani Pay started as an idea in 2019, um, and then it evolved um, through several hackathons in 2020 to become what it is now. My initial journey in the space is that I started as a blockchain researcher for something called the Institute of Blockchain Studies. Um, so I read a book um, by an author and she had written a book on uh, blockchain, the blueprint for a new economy. Um, after investigating much of her background, I found out that she had established something called the Institute for Blockchain Studies. And she had researchers around the world, um, you know, Sao Paulo, Brazil, Canada, um, Asia, and so on. But there was no researcher in Africa. And so I wrote an email and I was like, I'm very interested in researching the applications of this technology in Africa. And she was, you know, she was, she was graceful and she, she replied to the email. She gave me a job as a researcher that's back in 2016 so i started slowly researching what this technology is about then went on to participating very actively in 2017 and 2018 um, until you know, a point where i met a group of founders because kotani pay had an initial um, group of founders about five co-founders um, who thought uh, the technology has many benefits but is disconnected from the average african and that's how we began kotani pay in uh, 2019. crypto's impact in kenya goes beyond digital currencies it's creating numerous job opportunities many who flourish in crypto began the journey as far back as 2017. It was very nascent, so it was something that was starting out. Uh, not so many people knew about the technology of what it could do. Um, when I started out as a researcher, um, I could attend these meetups where we were five to ten people uh, in the meetup, and you know the most likely was a, a software developer or someone technical explaining how the technology works. Mm -hmm. So this is Bitcoin. You have nodes. You have a network. You have this thing called mining, and this is how it works. So that that was basically the kind of uh, community we had um, for you know for for the technology early on in 2016, entering into 2017. In 2017, late 2017, Bitcoin gets to $20,000 for the first time. Yeah. Um, and, and then that brings in a lot of people who are interested in the, you know, the money, the gains. So we, we then ended up with a mixed, a mixture of, you know, people in the community, um, um, anywhere from traders to, you know, just people who just want to make money. Around 2018, um, people start, started experimenting beyond uh, Bitcoin. So that's when um, platforms like Ethereum and another one called EOS became very popular. Uh, simply because on Bitcoin, you could only transact. On these other platforms, you could build decentralized applications. So you could go beyond just transacting um, to building applications that could do other things. So we have our first um, you know, communities around EOS, Eternity, um, Ethereum, uh, and so on. So, so, uh, and then beyond that, now we started now seeing people who are actually building companies. This is around now 2019, 2020. People who started focusing on building companies um, focused on the space. So, um, whether it's exchanges or on ramp, off ramp, or wallets. Um, and, and this was a case all the way to 2021, where a lot of these companies, whether in Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, uh, and Egypt, actually raised money to, to, to go about doing this work. Felix, originally on the path to medicine, took a sharp turn towards crypto. Why the switch? That's a question worth exploring. <laughs> 
I, in 2016, I was um, a medical school student. So I was doing a Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery at the University of Nairobi. I had taken a gap year, so that's a one year off, yeah. uh, to do something called Bachelor in Medical Physiology, which is a research course. It's a scientific research course. So they teach you how to think about things fundamentally from, um, from the ground. Um, usually admits only about four students uh, a year. Uh, so in my, in my time uh, you know, doing this course, I happened to just be roommates with um, several software developers from Strathmore, um, Strathmore Uni. And I could hear them talking about uh, something called the fourth industrial revolution. Okay, yeah. So we had the first industrial revolution, which was agriculture, second industrial revolution, which was had something to do with the, the steam and steam engine. Okay, yeah. And third industrial revolution had a lot to do with what we call the industrial revolution, so cars and everything else. And now they're talking about a set of technologies that will transform the world for the next century. Yeah. So we're talking about uh, artificial intelligence, um, the Internet of Things, um, blockchain, um, and so on and so forth, virtual reality, and so on and so forth. And so when I looked into each of these technologies, I actually experimented myself with all these technologies. So I bought, I bought a VR headset, experimented with it. I got into robotics, you know, bought a Raspberry Pi yeah. thing, tried to experiment with robotics. But I think the, 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 the easiest one for me, coming from the medicine side, uh, side and coming from a layman's uh, side, was blockchain. So blockchain was this permissionless um, global community that anyone could join and participate. Mm -hmm. So even if you didn't have any technical skills, you could join as a, as a community manager, you could join as a digital marketer, you could join as a, as a trader, mm -hmm. uh, and so on and so forth. And so I felt it was very inclusive, um, you know, as a technology. And so the more I, I delved into it, you know, even started coding um, in Python, started coding some smart contracts, I felt like this was a place where I was growing. It was more inviting for me than, than most of the other technologies. Um, so, so, so by the time I'm reading this book and you know, contacting this author, it was because of this journey I'd taken from just being a medical student to being somebody who, who is thinking about the future. So even if you look at my LinkedIn today, I call myself a future seeker. So I'm, I'm out seeking out like what, what does the future hold for, for us as, as, as humanity. Many thriving tech companies kick-started with college buddies and dorm mates. Katani follows suit, born from the collaboration of minds. I strongly believe you're an average of the five people you spend most time around. Yeah. Um, and I think just engaging with uh, um, some of these people really challenged me. So I remember having a conversation. We were working with one guy and he was telling me about you know Elon Musk and all these things, the great things he's doing and whatnot. And I could feel like I needed to deepen my knowledge on you know the fourth industrial revolution. Right? It, it could be anything else. Like we could be, we'd be having a conversation about anything else, girls, football, yeah. um, etc. But I, I, I felt like this was something inspiring something I could you know contribute to and something I could do so much about right so I, I personally believe um, your environment determines where you're going and and if I look at some of my friends um, some of them have ended ended up being you know founders some of them have ended up being great uh, developers some of them have ended up building you know amazing companies and amazing projects so it's 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 company matters basically like the people you spend your time with matter. Kotani wasn't just a name. It emerged on their journey, adding a touch of uniqueness to their story. Um, and EOS was a blockchain protocol that was launched in 2018. Yeah. And it was meant to solve some of the problems that Bitcoin has. So, for example, transaction speeds on Bitcoin are about uh, five, five, uh, five transactions per second back then, 2018. Um, it was still very expensive, um, you know, uh, for you to send transactions on Bitcoin. Um, it was also quite expensive for you to mine Bitcoin. So you needed very powerful computers to mine on the Bitcoin ecosystem. So. EOS comes with a concept called proof of stake, where instead of using computers 
to get consensus on the network to agree on transactions on the network you use your stick so you buy a couple of coins and then you vote or you stick um, for your favorite uh, node validators so EOS Nairobi was one of these validators so we we started it here in Africa it was the only one in Africa and we had this message to the world that we know what's happening um, you know within the blockchain space and we like Africans to benefit from those uh, you know from, from the from benefits of this technology yeah. uh, we got a lot of votes and we were one of the node validators so we we're one of the people who are running transactions for the EOS network um, so what happened over time is as we continued delving deeper into blockchain mm. and its benefits when it comes to payments when it comes to uh, settlement and so on uh, we realize it's very disconnected from the technologies people use locally so we have about 60 percent of africans who still use feature phone devices yeah. um, they still uh, have no access to the internet or if you have access to the internet and you have a smartphone bundles are still expensive you know like uh, internet uh, minutes are still expensive um, so we we decided we're going to focus on that problem so how do you how do you onboard this individuals who have a problem with uh, accessing uh, blockchain technology either because they are locked out of the internet or they're using old age devices you know and so on and so forth and because one of our jobs as EOS Nairobi was to educate people on this technology um, we realized that we needed to do more you know, for us to accomplish our mission you know on board as many as Africans as we would into web3 so what we use today for Facebook YouTube um, WhatsApp is called web2 it's read and write okay so the first version of the internet was just read a lot of the websites is probably you had a technical parent back in the 1990s will tell you the websites were only meant for reading so you know a website is posted and you only read you don't have comments likes um, and so on then we moved from reading to reading and writing now the third iteration of the internet is read write and own it's actually a very nice book written by uh, a venture capital partner at a16z called read write and own which is um, um, getting released this january 30th okay so so um, we felt we needed to accomplish this mission and kotani means accomplish in swan so we went through african languages trying to find out you know which is a friendly african uh, name that means accomplish and that's how we landed on on kotani from medicine to finance shifting wasn't a walk in the park this was a bold decision felix made if I was to look at my parents, my parents have always been very open yeah. about my decisions. Mm. Um, I think the way they raised me mm. was to be independent. Yeah. Um, so the way I think is very independent. Mm. The choices I make are very independent. Yeah. And I really enjoyed medicine in uni because I felt this was the only thing I could do that was challenging enough mm. not to get bored yeah okay so i felt like if i did anything else like ba or anything else i would be bored and you know we, with that boredom comes many other things so i, I engaged myself actively mm. in 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 medicine i was a very successful student that's why i got that uh, scholarship to the uh, research course um but then somewhere along the way i felt the hierarchy yeah. of medicine will not work for me the hierarchy and structure of medicine will not work for me because i wanted to discover more yeah. and i wanted to um you know to explore more and and that still remains the case uh, for me today and so um, around the time I was doing that research course, I had plenty of time. Um, so once I'm done with my research and my rats, so you, you have like 40 rats that you're working with, you're researching, you know, a particular chemical or something. Um, I will go and learn more about business. Yeah. So I started by learning about entrepreneurship. So there's a, there's a nice course on Udacity, 21, 21 steps of discipline entrepreneurship. I did that course. It was by um, MIT professor and he just thought you know it, it was basically how Silicon Valley companies build successful products yeah 
Okay, so how do they go about this process of discovering the value proposition? So value proposition is what pain are you solving? What gain are you making? Mm -hmm. And then how do you get it to the customer? So customer channels and customer relationships. Uh, which customer groups are you serving? So that's customer segments. Uh, what are your daily activities? Um, what are the costs that are incurred as you go about these daily activities? What's your revenue on this side? What's your cost on this side? What's your profit? Mm. It's as simple as that. Mm. And you know, it was it was just a very like there's an amazing framework of how to build a business. And I went about experimenting with that. So like I called my roommate from Strathmore, I was like, hey, let's build a business um, around this framework. And the first business we built was actually within the healthcare space, within the medical space. Because at the time in 2016, there were a lot of uh, there were a lot of uh, hospitals system so there are a lot of hospital system companies but none of them was catering towards dentists so dentists don't have a mortuary they don't have a pharmacy they don't have a bed space they just have this this single bench um, so how do I create a product that serves a dentist and that product was extremely successful to the point that by the time I was doing um, you know the research that I was doing around blockchain I could invest some small all uh, funds here and there in blockchain assets. Mm. You know, I could invest in Ripple, I could invest in Ethereum, mm. I could see how these uh, blockchain protocols are actually working and why they're advantageous, you know, they are fast. So I can send your transaction in 30 seconds, you have it. Doesn't matter where you are in the world. Yeah. Like if you're in Atlanta, you send me a transaction here in Kenya, in about 30 seconds to a minute, I have that transaction. Um, depending on the blockchain protocols you're using, they're also quite cheap. So if you're using proof of stake blockchains and Ethereum has even um, become a proof of stake blockchain very soon, you're spending close to nothing for that transaction. So let's say you're sending a million Kenya shillings to somebody in Atlanta. You can spend, let's say, something like uh, 500 bob or 200 bob um, on top of that they are immutable and transparent so if you have used a bank to receive money or send money you know that if you send money abroad it's probably three days and you don't know where the money is because they use something called the correspondent banking system money comes from Kenya to Egypt to other places then finally gets the guy in New York uh, but if you're using a blockchain you're seeing it you're seeing oh I have uh, 16 blockchain confirmations and I need only 50 of them for this transaction to be complete mm -hmm. okay yeah. so you wait 30 40 50 oh money has reached the other side you call the other person have you or you whatsapp them have you received the funds they're like yeah we received the funds um, blockchains apart from being transparent are also immutable once you have done that transaction mm -hmm. that's it like nobody can reverse the transaction there's nothing like the transaction failed right if you have you know enough enough fees and so on so I, I could see the benefit of this technology um, but it was a transition basically what I'm talking about is being an entrepreneur is a journey there's a lot of studying on Tanipe with a medical background required a savvy strategy our five co-founders um, I didn't have all the knowledge yeah. you know when we were starting Kotanipe it was 2019 um, and I came from a strategy point of view. So strategy, which is you plan for the future. So these are things I'd learned um, in the Udacity course, but there are also things I'd learned at the Institute for Blockchain Studies. So they were teaching us a lot about how do you strategize for the future. So how do you create a vision? What does that mean? How do you create a mission? How do you create strategic objectives? How do you create tactics that you are, you know, daily activities that you're carrying out every day? And then how do you evaluate, you know, where you are? in your vision and mission and, and strategy. Mm -hmm. So I, when, when I was coming into Kotani, I was coming in because I was bringing the strategic uh, you know, aspect. Mm -hmm. I had doubled in uh, some of the other aspects of a startup. So I, for example, started coding in Python. So I understood mm -hmm. a bit of the tech stuff, you know, like um, you know, the environment variables, I understood the, mm -hmm. uh, the smart contracts, the basics of how to code. Mm -hmm. And so, mm, when I'm speaking to a developer and when I'm speaking to our chief technology officer back then, I understand what he's saying because I have 
done it. I have been through a six month course where I was, I have the basics of coding. Um, and then I had also doubled on the finance side. And that was very simple for me. Just, I just used to watch CNBC and Bloomberg, that's it. Like I just watched CNBC and Bloomberg, you know, like Kenyan news at some point got very tiring for me. Like, so like <laughs> I decided, you know, instead of watching, wasting my time watching like um, politics and um, a lot of these socialites and everything. Like I just double down on Bloomberg and CNBC and you know, you can pick up a lot and you learn a lot just by you know by, by by listening to some of those things and it pushed me now to even do courses on economics macroeconomics so like how do world uh, events if affect economies and microeconomies so like if you're thinking about kenya as a microeconomy what affects uh, the microeconomy so then i could interact with all these other founders so basically what i'm saying is if you're building anything successful yeah. you're not going to do it alone yeah. you need other people so in Dinko Tani to within the five co-founders we had people who are good in uh, finance mm -hmm. okay a guy had done six CPAs mm -hmm. we had uh, somebody else who had done uh, the technical pieces mm -hmm. we had somebody else who had uh, uh, done the operations so running a company day to day mm -hmm. um, but for you to successfully engage these people you also need to be knowledgeable so you need to understand where someone is coming from Securing the first client is a universal challenge, but breaking ground in the crypto fintech world adds a layer of extra difficulty. So the, the biggest challenge at the beginning of Kotanipe was defining what Kotanipe is. Like what's a product? What are we building here? And who are we building it for? Yeah. Okay. So so I used the framework I was talking about, which is called the business canvas model, value proposition, customer relationships, customer channels, customer segments, and so on and so forth, activities to try and define the product. And I was very far away from what the product really was. Um, but the good thing about that framework is it encourages, encourages something called pivoting. So if I have built out a business canvas, yeah. and I say this is the product and these are the customers mm -hmm. and this is how I'm going to get the product to the customers and these are going to be my key activities and costs mm -hmm. and revenue streams. Mm -hmm. I need to try it out. Yeah. So the, the, the course encourages that you know you get out there, mm -hmm. talk to customers, tell them this is your product, mm -hmm. tell them this is the problem you're trying to solve, etc, etc, right? And in getting out there, mm -hmm. customers will give you feedback. So a customer will tell you, ah, mm, you know, it's not something I need. Or a customer will tell you, this is something we definitely need. We can even start today, right? And if a customer tells you that, that's a sweet spot. Yeah. Okay. That's what you need to be solving for. Okay. Because I meet a lot of uh, entrepreneurs and founders who are in love with the idea. Yeah. Ideas you know, don't don't matter that much what matters is the customer's problem and are you solving the customer's problem so if you start from the point of your idea yeah. but then you test that idea in the real world and what you get is feedback when you get feedback um, you can know whether you are completely off or you are on the sweet spot and so when you discover the sweet spot you tailor a service and a product for that sweet spot so what we did for Kotani Pay is we attended um, we attended a, a meetup by uh, one of the blockchain protocols it was Silo Silo at the time and they described a problem they had so they said we have been sending stable coins stable coins are digital assets they are built on the blockchain um, to two workers so we have these workers in kibera they are um, doing certain tasks and for those tasks they are earning stable coins on a wallet okay and then what we have to do is we have to get someone with actual cash to go to kibera yeah. and exchange these stable coins yeah for cash the only problem is this person is already known 
Yeah. So people already know this guy comes with cash yeah. at a particular time of day. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so it's become very <laughs> it's become very insecure to exchange cash for uh, for the stablecoin assets. Yeah. And so when we listen to that, my mind just like you know, this is a problem that needs to be solved. And do we have the expertise internally to solve this problem? Yes, we are all blockchain guys. We have done node validation, right? We understand how to use our local payment systems. And so that's how we go about building the first product within Kotani Pay, which is here is CELO. They're sending stable coins to a gig worker um, in Kibera. The gig worker needs to go to a cash point every day to exchange their CELO tokens for cash. How can we make that process seamless? Okay, so we said we can build an API for you guys so that your Kibra worker, once they receive their CUSD, they can just exchange it on their phones for M-Pesa. They don't have to necessarily go to a cash point. Every business faces tough times. But for crypto fintech company, the hurdles are particularly demanding. Felix and his team navigated these challenges and recently secured a whopping 2 million US dollars funding to expand the cross-border platform. So that's also a journey, right? So like if you are talking about 2 million USD, you're talking about three years of funding or raising. Um, and so the way we got to that, and I encourage many entrepreneurs who are in tech, so you, you know, it might be in other things, but the ones who are in tech, you, you go through these, I call them stages. So the first stage is you have a prototype or something, a product you think might work, and you have to expose it to the public. You have to move beyond the echo chamber of five guys who are telling you, this product is good, it works, I tried it today, you know? <laughs> to like the general public and what the general public thinks about your product and what, it, what, what, what it's worth. And the way to do it in the tech space is you attend something called a hackathon. So you register your team, other people register their teams, it's a competition, and the ones who are most innovative win a prize. You know, that's the purpose of a hackathon. Um, and so we attended many hackathons. Some we won, some we lost. Mm. The good thing about hackathons is when you win, you're given prize money. Mm. So it gives you time to develop your prototype and it gives you time to continue the journey. Um, then after hackathons comes things called grants. Mm. So in a hackathon, you're just proving these are the failures of my product. Um, and you know, this is usually a team of four guys or four guys and one girl. Unfortunately, there's still, you know, that inequity issue when it comes to, um, to, to software and coding. So you move from that five team, team of five to a place where you apply for things called grants, tech grants. And tech grants are there in AI, tech grants are there in Web3, tech grants are everywhere. If you're, if you're building around climate tech, green economy, there are grants. If you're building around uh, um, uh, blue, in, blue economy, fisheries, oceans, there are grants. So grants teach you how to be, you know, accountable. So they're usually timelines. So you're, you're saying you're going to complete this activity in three months. And after three months, this grant, this amount is unlocked. So it teaches you to be accountable. Only then can you then say, according to me, only then can you then go and say to a investor, to an investor. Mm -hmm. And there, there, are four, there are four stages also in the investment space. So you have angel investor, does very small checks, maybe below $10,000, okay? Because they probably believe in your idea and you give them a huge chunk of your of your company until you know, later, later you find out it is a huge chunk. Yeah. You know, when you say 2% of my company, you know, early on, you don't see it as anything until, you know, much later, but you give them that much because they believed in him. Uh, then there is, um, after angel investor, there are those ones who are called, uh, uh, you know, uh, VCs, venture capitalists. After that, you have institutional investors. So these ones are big banks, usually global banks. They're either in Europe, they're in US, they're in Japan, all these other places. So once you finish a grant, you can go to a VC. Why, 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 why go to a VC at that stage? Because number one, you have a proven prototype. 
you have built a product that works you have tested it out with customers you have tested it out in hackathons people have told you ah this part of your product is shit this part of your product is great okay um you have moved on to a grants program where you have been told okay take your product and score it against a timeline so can you achieve these milestones yeah. in six months you can achieve it in 12 months so i have onboarded a thousand users mm. you know in 12 months yeah. or i've onboarded 1500 users in 12 months now you take that what we call in the space traction you know how much progress you have made you take that traction you go to an investor you say now this i think is a sustainable business because if i only add 5000 other users i mean the money you know like i'm actually cash flow positive or i'm profitable okay so i have tested this thing out with grants i have 1200 users they're using this product they like it this is how much you're making from it and if i get to 5000 users i will be making this much in money and if i get to 10 100,000 users i'll be making this much in money so most vcs most venture capitalists will be looking at what you have achieved so far what they call traction and then what are your projections for the future usually usually three three years into the future um, so at this stage of vcs the way you meet vcs is by enrolling into things called incubators and accelerator programs because incubators are places where you nurse your idea accelerators are places where you accelerate your idea but the way they are structured is you have a program of about 10 weeks and at the end of 10 weeks they introduce you to investors so like in the case of Kotanipe we went through that journey so we had a hackathon um, the many there, there are so many honestly after the hackathons and winning prize money here and there losing some and feeling you know <laughs> bad about it um we entered into a grant program so there was something called the silo grant program it was it was coming in waves so we were part of beneficiaries of the wave one mm. then after that we entered into something called an accelerator program so we entered into flory's accelerator program 10 weeks of tough hard work you probably heard of some of these accelerators some of them are, are world renowned you know like uh, um, y combinator or um, or tech stars or seed stars so some of them are very popular but there are also others that are not so popular but they are valuable okay so like flory at the end of 10 weeks we had something called a demo day where you present to investors from that uh, demo day we got uh, five to six investors now you're in a different place altogether because now you made promises um, you have projections for the next three years you need now to build an actual business with talent so what do you do you start onboarding talent so talent has a lot to do with what a person can accomplish with the skills they have more than what their resume says so you can give me your cv i look at it you are in this and this school you did this and this and what's not but what have you accomplished so far with the skills you have so that's talent so you need to onboard great talent because in a startup you're doing much more than is required of you yeah. okay so somebody comes with great resume what have they accomplished and if you feel they have a great resume and they have accomplished a lot that's good talent you onboard them you bring them into uh, your tribe and then you build together and what you're doing is as you build together you're trying to achieve milestones that have been set for you by your investors okay so so if you look at that journey you're talking about a three to six year journey right like from start to the point where you actually get investors and if you achieve your goals for the first investors then the primary rule is investors know investors so if you are successful with one investor he introduces you to other investors you understand and that and that then goes like that so then we, we in the in the space within the startup space within the investor space we talk about uh, seed and then you start series a series b series c and you can go all the way to series j because of those introductions that are coming from investors and when investors are introducing you to other investors they'll say you have achieved this these guys 
achieved this over the last three years. This is what they did, and this is why I believe you should invest in them. You understand? So that's where you get your Facebooks, your Amazons, your Teslas, your SpaceXs, all these companies that have been built out of nothing. It's because of this uh, ecosystem, it's because of this relationship. So I always tell builders and companies, don't build alone, build in an ecosystem. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You might be doing uh, digital marketing stuff, you might be doing content production, you might be doing tech stuff like we're doing, you might be doing agriculture cultural stuff, climate tech, build within an ecosystem because people know people, they can introduce you if you're successful enough and you can grow your business to, to, to become even a global business. With experience in both medicine and finance, Felix Masharia offers valuable advice for those looking to build something of their own in this ever-evolving landscape. At a very high level, the world we live in today is complex. And by complex, I mean it comes in layers and layers, okay? And, and you can't unravel all the layers. Um, but it's possible for you to have a deep understanding of the world if you take time to learn, okay? So a lot of the knowledge and information that we need to survive in this century is free. It's been made free. like. There are courses about anything on YouTube, Udacity, Udemy, you, know, you name it. There are courses from MIT, Stanford, Harvard, like on how to do anything. The most important thing about a person is you need to know yourself. So you need to know like what works for you. Okay. So what is it that works for me? And can I, can I project like if I was five years, 10 years down the line, would I be happy doing this thing? Okay. And then build your knowledge in that thing. In fact, one of my mentors says, become the best, you know, become the 10% yeah. um, in your area, whatever that area is. African correspondence for this and that. Um, so information is free. It's too much. It's, it can overwhelm you if you don't know where you're headed but if you know what you you know what you want to achieve and where you're headed then it becomes very simple because you know it's free so it's just a matter of learning and then practicing it um, the second bit for somebody who's starting in web3 is you definitely have to you have to you have to do it you have to try um, theory is uh, great but like it's not enough so I have to go beyond theory and I have to go into practice. So um, if I'm in Web3, what is a wallet? What is a blockchain? What is a smart contract? Okay, basics. How do I send? Um, how much am I charged for what I send? Okay, how do I connect to several protocols around the world? So like if I want to enter into decentralized finance, how do I do it? If I want to enter into decentralized science, how do I do it? If I want to enter into decentralized social, diesel how do i do it so i need to practice um you cannot just be a theorist you need to you need to practice and then the final part is how do i collaborate with others to achieve my goals and you know the global good and again um, you could use the internet today to envy people on Instagram and pour a lot of hate speech and vitriol on Twitter, or you could use it to collaborate with people around the world, people like you, somebody like you in Bangladesh or Egypt or Brazil, who wants to achieve the same things and who wants the same thing for themselves. So like you could go about, and, and this is, this is possible today. You could go about collaborating with other people around the world in achieving your, your own goals. Because the problem with the past was, if I was in the village, and I'm the only person who's passionate about nuclear physics in the village, then I'll probably be the only person who's passionate about nuclear physics in the village for a long time. But today, 
if you're passionate about nuclear physics, mm. there are people around the world that you can collaborate with. So the simple thing is know what you want. And I know that's, that's kind of cliche, but it matters more in today's world because there's so many things to do and there are so many things to choose from. Mm. It's just very important for you to be very clear. Like if I had this and if I was doing this, I know definitely my happiness, you know, like I'm, I'm okay with this. Then number two is to move beyond theory, accumulate as much knowledge as you can because it's free, but move beyond theory to actually practicing it, right? Uh, like the podcast today. And then finally, um, you want to collaborate with others. Why? Because others around the world, beyond your environment, who have the same interests as you, can help you learn faster and can help you learn more. It's just as simple as that. That's what I did. And, and I think that's, that's what many other people can do. It's a very general formula on how to succeed in uh, at least the early 21st century. So that's the end of our interview. But before we finish, um, I'd like to know, like, you know, like one answer. As a CEO, which is that one skill you feel like you know you have to master? Strategy. So strategy is foresight, seeing the future, and then, and the future here is like three years to six years ahead, and planning for that. So that's not, you know, that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>